willkommen zur Sendung Philosophie im Gespräch. Heute wieder hier in der Galerie R2 in der Lindengasse im 7. Bezirk. Wir haben heute einen Gast aus Kalifornien bei uns hier in Wien, die Anna Lahm. Herzlich willkommen. Welcome to Vienna. Thank you. Und ja, uh, yeah, sie ist gerade hier und macht einen Workshop mit dem Thema Mütter und Töchter. Um, und wir haben sie heute eingeladen um, zu dem Thema, wie können wir von der Scham hinkommen zur Ermächtigung der Frau, uh, besonders im Thema, mit dem Thema Menstruation. Ich werde in Englisch sprechen und ich glaube, unsere Zuseherinnen und Zuhörerinnen werden das meiste verstehen. So, I'm going to speak English now. So, yes. Welcome to Vienna. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time oh. and I'm delighted. <laughs> yeah, so you come from California, you yes. live there. I live there. Yeah. And you dedicate your your life now for how many years uh, in for this theme now? How, for how 20, many? about 20 years now. 20 years. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And your focus in uh, coming into that theme, you already published a book, Becoming Peers, and this is your book. When did you publish this book? Uh, about three years ago, four almost. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And Becoming Peers, um, how can you translate that for everybody? What becoming equal, so here is mother and here is daughter, and the baby is dependent on the mother and the mother does everything and then when the girls start bleeding there needs to be some acknowledgement that we are starting to share something as peers as equals when a girl starts her blood she's not yet an adult the mother still has a lot of responsibility the girl can't drive she's not mature enough for sexual interactions there's lots that she's not ready for but the fact that she is cycling and menstruating is putting her on one level mm -hmm. together with her mother and this is something we don't consciously share and i'm inviting mothers and and girls to start sharing that consciously as, as a bond between them. Mm -hmm. I was born in Romania and moved with my family when I was three to Israel. So Israel is where I grew up until I was 28. So the majority of my formative years were in Israel. And in Israel, I trained in uh, philosophy and theater, and I trained in conflict resolution, mediation, and worked at a school for peace in dialogue between Jewish and Palestinian people. And then I moved to England, where in London, I trained in psychotherapy and continued to uh, offer my work of conflict resolution, mostly in the workplace between um, people of different cultures, different religions within the workplace, mostly non-profit organizations. And uh, then moved to the United States, to California in 92. And it was then that my journey started in terms of working with menstruation and menstrual empowerment. And it started as a personal journey. So I was working, I had a relationship that I was fulfilled in, I had work that I loved, mm -hmm. but once a month I was getting crazy. I was completely not myself. And there was this one part of my life that wasn't working, so I decided to look into it and started a healing journey to make peace with my own menstruation. I started researching and realized how deeply in all the cultures of the world, which we will touch upon in a minute, but in all cultures of the world, the blood, woman's blood was honored as part of life. And I realized how divorced we are as women from that honor, how shameful 
our blood is, how shameful the blood was in my consciousness, how much I thought that it's something that is a curse, a nuisance, a bother that I don't want to deal with. And um, one of the first things that shifted for me was that I traveled to see um, Northern California and I came upon a health food store and I saw menstrual cloth pads, reusable cloth pads. I never before thought that they still existed. I knew that my grandmother had the rag, <laughs> but that's how it was called, the rag. And the expression is still you being on the rag is from that time. So there was a testimony in, on the packet from a woman who started using them and she said, ever since I started using the cloth, I started expecting my menstruation with joy. And I thought, yeah, right, I did not believe it. But I was interested enough and I was suffering enough with not physical pain, but with emotional upheaval inside every month that I thought, okay, I'm gonna see. What, where this brings me and I started using the cloth and it was a mind quake mm. an earthquake in my mind and the the first thing I realized is how divorced I am from my own body that the blood that comes from me is trash mm -hmm. I put it in the in the bin and and I think of it as trash but when I had the cloth, I had to soak it mm -hmm. in water mm -hmm. and I had to handle it. And there was both a fascination and, and a disgust. So this led me to a whole journey of starting to make peace with, with my cycle, with my actual blood, starting to investigate what this blood is which is the nourishment of a baby that our body sheds out when we don't conceive. And so this led me to um, realize not, all, not only how much I was divorced from my body, but also how divorced I am from my rhythm. Mm -hmm. That there are times of the month when I'm outward and I'm expanding like the moon mm. and there are times when I need to go inward and withdraw and be quiet and rest and renew and I realized that my irritation and my emotional upheaval is because I was trying to make every day be the same mm -hmm. so when I started taking time off on my first day on my second day of my blood then all of a sudden I didn't have irritation because there was no one to be irritated with because I was by myself, napping and making art and journaling and, and just going inward. Mm -hmm. So um, it shifted the whole quality of my life. Mm -hmm. And the women around me noticed that, women friends and, and colleagues, and were asking me what, what was happening. And when I started describing the process I went through, um, they asked to learn that and to be guided and I realized mm -hmm. that there was no one that was doing it <laughs> and because I was already a facilitator and I already had the experience and the skill of working with people I called my first menstrual empowerment circle in San Diego in 1993 or 94 and it was mm -hmm. again a mind quake for every single woman because none of us talked about mm -hmm. it before with each other. It was a bond and a sisterhood that r made me realize that I need to continue and take this out to the world, to other women. Um, so so that's, that's the description of, of how I came to that. So that, that's been, yeah, almost 20 years now. Mm -hmm. So you worked first more in business kind of? You were like in organizations, non-profit organization doing yes. conflict man management, intercultural yes. management. Yes. And now you shifted to yes. work with women yes. and empowerment of women. Yes. I remember I was working in, uh, in the banking industry as an economist and environment manager and it was really a tough time and it was 1994 and I lost my period 
Mm. I was like really young and I, for one and a half year I didn't have my period. Mm. And I thought, what is going on? Nobody could help me. And finally I found a traditional Chinese medicine uh, uh, doctor and he said, well, would you tell me how much you work continuously, without break, without mm. interruption, and with so much pressure, I mean, it was a, it was a, a huge company with 10,000 people and so, and, uh, and he said, well, this is like in war, you are in the status of being in war, you are in such a pressure, yes. work so hard, like yes. a man, like a woman in war, and also yes. in war, the, the, the ni nature uh, doesn't want to get babies. Yes. So you have no period. So don't wonder. It is the best for your body because yes. your body makes like a climate and the energy resource action. So that's why. And then I thought, okay, whoa, is this now the solution? I thought, no, stop. I had to stop something. Yes. Yeah, the body is so wise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at least it stopped the, right. the cycle, right. yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thank you. If yes. we speak now about, um, you said you got in connection with the blood of yourself, yes. which is like the nourishment for a new baby, which yes. comes out of us. And we all bleed as women, yes. most of us, so different times. At some point in our life we all yeah. do. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the approach that we as women get more connected to something what is our common ground yes. nowadays and honoring. Yes. I uh, suffer a lot from advertisement uh, where women are not honored as women. Yes. But just as objects, sexual yes. objects. Yes. So how how did this if you you went on because it was not always like that. Yes. Um, that blood and bleeding and menstruation was a shame. Yes. Yes, in every and all traditional cultures, indigenous cultures around the world, there is evidence of the, the cultures being focused on the life giver, and the life giver was the woman. Mm -hmm. The blood is part of the cycle of life. Without menstruating, we wouldn't be able to give birth. So the, the culture itself was dependent on women bleeding because that was the, the next generation. That was the way of, of bringing life into the world. And in all indigenous cultures, there is evidence of the women withdrawing from the hustle and bustle of daily life to what is known in Native American traditions, the moon lodge, some cultures called the moon huts. Um, there is the red tent, which is more fictional, the book by Anita Diamant, she kind of lived into the image of what it could be like. But the evidence is that women withdrew from the daily mundane tasks because it was understood that the time of the blood is a time of it's known as the time when the veil between the worlds is thinnest mm -hmm. so there there is the thin veil between the world of spirit and the world of of matter of everyday life and it was understood that women, when they're bleeding, they're in a shamanic state, that they are in a, in a prophetic state. And you cannot prophesize if you're taking care of babies or if you are cooking or if you're doing daily tasks. So the women withdrew into their moon lodges, the moon huts, where they could be with each other, where they could uh, rest, where they could take care of their physical body and renew themselves and where they could dream prophecies for the tribe. So in, um, for example, in Native American uh, moon lodges, the women were sleeping around the altar in the moon lodge with their heads around the altar and their bodies out like the spokes of the wheel. And people would come and bring questions, 
questions about their personal life and questions that the elders would bring about how to conduct the life of the tribe, including whether or not to go to war. And the women would dream the prophecies and the answers and the tribe and the elders were committed to follow the, um, the oracle of the bleeding women. So it was completely clear and understood that in order for them to fulfill the oracle, they cannot be engaged in daily life. And girls from the time of their first blood will start sitting in the tents with their mothers. So that's another thing which is striking to me about the red tent or the moon lodge is that it was a multi-generational mm -hmm. circle. Usually, you know, the kids are, are with themselves and the elders have their own circles, but this was the one place in the tribe where girls from the time that they started, it could be 11, 12, 13, all the way to women in their 50s when they finish bleeding, they were all peers again. So there is no hierarchy there because they're all there as peers, as bleeding girls and women. And in that, they're equal. Yeah. They share that. <laughs> so if we see in history nowadays, um, we have this shame. Where does this shame come, come from? And how can we like see from history, like you said now, I mean, everybody would like to say, wow, how, how, how can I take a day off if I can't because I have to work, I have my family. Yeah. And so, so what would be today like making the bridge from shame to empowerment today? What, what would you recommend as? Hmm. I would say one of the first things is to really understand what the blood is. Mm -hmm. So the blood is, this blood that in, in the advertisement and, and in the culture we see as the curse and as something that we have to put in the trash, is the inner lining of our womb. So every month our wise body prepares for life. And most months we don't conceive. But when we do, if we do, this inner lining of our womb, which is full of nutrients and nourishment, these uh, tissues that are life-supporting, are that tissue that will support the fetus for nine months until it's ready to be born. So they're full of, of life. They're, they're, it's a life substance. And I'm thinking that no one, even in this culture that hates and, and uh, shames menstruation, would think that the lining of a womb of a pregnant woman is trash. Obviously not. So how come if we don't conceive, and most of our life we're not pregnant, even those who choose to become mothers, most of their lives don't conceive on a monthly basis. How come the same substance that is so life-giving becomes from a support of life to trash. The, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I'd say the first thing for a woman and a girl to do is to start realizing what is it. One of the things I didn't mention when I started using my cloth pads is that I realized that because this is the nourishment of life, that it will feed all life, any life, not only the life mm -hmm. of a baby. So the water in which my pads were soaking, I started feeding to my plants, my house plants, and psh, they shot up and they were happier than <laughs> ever. And I, there is no other fertilizer that yeah. works so much mm -hmm. magically as the blood which by the way recently the scientists have discovered i don't know if you know that that the menstrual blood is also a source of stem cells do you know that mm -hmm. what did you yeah yeah there, it's a source of stem cells i mean must be because it's a nourishment for a new for a baby exactly I mean, for new life exactly and you say you know we have the word mutterkuchen so it's mutterkuchen it's the cake of mother cake you mm. know it's so nice because it's like baking a baby yes and of course it must be yes so valuable such yes. a pressure yes we every month produce our our body produces 
um, yeah, nice story yeah. to have with the garden. Yeah. I mean, yes. when many women can try that out. Yes, <laughs> yeah. even in the city, put the it's the in the house plants. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So one step is to start getting familiar with what is the blood. So yeah. that it 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 is a friend. It is a a part of our body rather than this yuck thing that that we don't want. Mm-hmm. Another thing that I invite women and girls to share with, as, as a first step is to tell the stories of their first blood because mm-hmm. it is striking to me how much this story is silent. That we as women, you know, we have been liberated for many years and we've been sitting in circles of women for years and we told and tell the stories to each other of how we lost our virginities and we tell the stories of abuse and we tell the stories of recovery and triumph of our lives, but the story of our blood is silent. It's taboo. We're, we're quiet about it. When I did that first um, circle that I described in, in 93 in San Diego, we shared the story of our first blood, and every single woman in the room told the story for the first time ever. That story was silent, and just that was healing in a profound way Mm -hmm. because not only that we gave voice to something that we held in shame inside of us but also that every woman in the room could relate to every story we came from different cultures our the details of our stories were different but the emotional content was the same and every woman could understand and deeply resonate with every story mm-hmm. and that was such a bond such a healing so starting to give voice to this silence to this silent story within us that's something that any girl and any woman can do she may not feel comfortable yet to feed her blood to the plants but she can tell the story of her first blood and the question that you asked about um, women can't take the first day of their period off and and a lot of women ask me about that okay I want to honor but I can't I'm working nine to five Mm -hmm. and how can I do that so I would say that what's most important is the intention of Mm -hmm. honoring so if you get up 10 minutes earlier and you light a candle Mm -hmm. and you sit quietly and you honor the fact that this is not a regular day that this is the first day of your blood and you are releasing a sacred substance, a life-giving mm. substance from your body. Your work day from 9 to 5 would look differently than if you were pretending that it's not there, it's a day like any other day and all is the same except that you have a headache and then you take a pill, <laughs> you know. So if you can, it is wonderful to take the time. Maybe you can take a half a day off, maybe you can take an hour, but if you can't do even that, then take 10 minutes in the morning and it really is more about the intention of honoring the fact that this is not a day like any other day than the length of time that that a woman takes. And that is something that the shifting of the intention is something that everyone can do even if they work that hard. How do you make this bridge by, you know, honoring yourself? Because I guess it's also the generation now, you know, everyday sports, everyday making everything everywhere in this world. Yeah. And how, uh, I mean, how do you make the bridge between mothers and daughters or sisters? Mm. How, how can you do that? Because the elder generation, like me and elder ones, the taboo was even bigger. Yes. You know, yes. ah, and now, and of course, after the war, hard work, and it's just disgusting. Yes, yep. So the bridge is the, the my message for women is that the bridge starts with them. Mm-hmm. That they can't have something different for their girls until they are recognizing the sacredness within themselves. So I think that we have an opportunity here as women of this generation to really shift the tide, to really change this 
a chain of generations mm -hmm. which passed from mother to daughter in the last quite a few generations. You know, our, our mothers were not welcomed and didn't honor mm -hmm. their blood. Our grandmothers weren't, their mothers weren't. So, so we have a very exciting opportunity of shifting that and we cannot shift this for our daughters and until we shift it for ourselves. So the way that I invite women to shift the consciousness of their daughters is by starting with them, their own consciousness. So when mother comes to me and says, I want you to work with my daughter, then I always say, I will not start with <laughs> you, my da your daughter. I would start with you. We have to start with the mothers and start making peace with their own cycle, starting to honor themselves and their own cycle. And the picture that I see is that the mother usually, a lot of mothers come, that come to me and want for something different for the girls, they say the girls are running away, they don't want to hear about it. So it goes something like this, so I say, well, what do you say to her? So usually it is, for you it's going to be different. I, I didn't have anything, but for you it's going to be different and you'll remember it for the rest of your life and for you it was going to be wonderful and the girls are just <laughs> running away because there is so much intensity there and the intensity I interpret as the hunger inside of the mother to herself be welcomed. So what the mothers are trying is to feed their own hunger by doing something different for their daughters and their daughters run away wisely because it's not their job to meet this hunger in the mother it's not theirs to to meet so i say let's leave the girls aside for a moment and let them breathe and rest and let's feed the girl that you once were and was never welcomed into womanhood and soothe her and see what she needed and what she did not receive at the time of her first blood. And then when the mothers are fed and the girl inside of them is fulfilled, then they can come to their girls from a full place, not from a hungry place. And then the girls don't run away anymore because it's, it's not this invasion, it's more come and let me tell you how it was for me when I first started my blood. So the invitation then is to realize for the mothers, once they've made peace, that there is something that they're sharing with their daughters. It's not an education for, I will make it for you so that you will see how wonderful it is to be a woman. I don't think so, but you will. <laughs> so it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. You know, starting with the girls is like starting to build from the second floor. Mm. So we have to start with the foundations which is our own generation, the mothers themselves. Wow. Us. And when it starts with us, we are modeling something mm -hmm. for our girls and we don't have to educate them. We don't have mm -hmm. to be um, so concerned about teaching them. We just be ourselves differently and they see. Mm -hmm. In the same way that we saw our mothers and we realized that it's a mm -hmm. curse, mm -hmm. <laughs> they see us. If we're different, then we don't need to teach them as much as become role models. So by us modeling that, mm -hmm. we are shifting the tide within one generation. It doesn't take more than that, but it does take us shifting first. And as we do not get support of our Western at least, Western society. Yes. As there, as a woman, you should, you know, for 24 hours, work and be ready for every yes. type of work and desires from outside so this was not always like so there was in and still is in matrilinear cultures nowadays in this world in different societies besides the western society isn't there still this way of honoring the blood as yes. a value for women yes. and honoring women. Yes. Like yeah. uh, matrilinear or 
um, yes. societies. Could yes. you speak about uh, these societies still living in this planet? Yes. Uh, a bit, and what is matrilinear? Uh, one of the places where there is an unbroken tradition is in Kerala in India. Uh, Kerala is a state in southern India where um, girls are still celebrated by the whole of the tribe. Mm -hmm. So there are three days of celebrations. Um, the women as well as the men, the uncles, the, the grandparents, uh, the whole of the village mm -hmm. comes and honors the girl on her first menstruation with song, with an enormous amount of flowers, flower petals, um, washing of her feet, giving her gifts, uh, honoring her for entering womanhood. And over there in that, uh, in that part of the world, it is an unbroken tradition. It mm -hmm. never stopped. Mm -hmm. And it is amazing to think about the fact that every little girl that grows up there grows up seeing her cousins mm -hmm. and the other girls of the village and knowing that one day it will be her turn. So it's not something that has to be reclaimed. Mm -hmm. It's something that is part of life, part of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, another place is uh, in Native American tribes. Some of them, uh, the one I'm familiar with most is the Navajo. Mm -hmm. And in the Navajo tradition, there is the Kinalda celebration, which is the celebration of the girl coming of age at the first blood. And again, the whole village comes to celebrate with her. There is a, a five-day celebration which is very elaborate and the girl has tasks that she has to fulfill and the, the tribe has their, their container around her. She's in a, in a hut with, with her mentor, not her mother, but her mentor, a woman from the tribe. The, the uh, people of the tribe are singing all around her throughout the five days and um, she has to fulfill tasks and at the end of it, she, um, she, over five days, she grinds with ha by hand five pounds of corn. Mm -hmm. And by the end of it, um, well, through the days, the men of her family, her grandfather, her father and the uncles are uh, digging a pit in the ground and at the end of it, when the, the last night she takes all the corn, she makes butter to make, a, to make a, a cake mix and she pours it, they light it in fire and it cooks the whole night mm -hmm. and this is the cake of the sun, it is golden because of the, the corn and in the morning she feeds the people in her tribe one by one, so she makes eye contact with every mm -hmm. single person in the tribe and feeds them. Yeah, yeah, that's so right. may you say that uh, Kerala or, or these Navajo people and societies are matrilinear or matrifocal or matriarchal? I would love you to, to give an, an, an insight of, of these definitions yes. and what they mean in life. Okay. Please. So the, the words, I'll start with, uh, with matriarchal. Mm -hmm. Matriarchal, is, it has the word hierarchy. Mm -hmm. it, the, the moment we have patriarchal society and the hierarchy is that of the pater, the father is the, the top of the hierarchy and all the, the assets, the name goes from the, the father to the son. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, and it, uh, it is a hierarchical, not equal society. Matriarchal is the same in reverse. And a lot of people who talk about the ancient times when women were in power, they talk about matriarchy. And I personally disagree with the term because I think since it has the word hierarchy in it, it implies that it's the same hierarchy that we have today, but in reverse. Instead of men being on top, women were on top. And I don't think that was no, the case. No. So uh, that is a word that, um, that talks about women being on top of the hierarchy, but, they are, but it's, it's uh, a mistaken yeah. word. So the, the picture really is of matrilineal and matrifocal societies. Matrilineal means that the line of the mother is the line where the name and the property 
goes and the knowledge. So in the same way that um, here in these cultures, the Western cultures, there is um, the property and the name goes from father to son. The, in matrilineal societies, the knowledge, the property, the name went from mother to daughter. There are tribes in, uh, I think some in, in uh, uh, villages in, in India, but I think there are some tribes in, in Native American where the, fa the, the husband would move and live in the village of the woman that he chooses to mm -hmm. spend his life with. So that the line is a matrilineal line. So the, the men move villages and the women are the ones who are passing on the, the knowledge and the property. Mm -hmm. Matrifocal is the focus of the culture, the focus of the tribe, the focus of the society is on women and children. Mm -hmm. So there is a slight difference there between the focus being there and in some they're both matrilineal and matrifocal. I'm thinking in Kerala, for instance, and um, in the Navajo tribes, I would not say that they're matrilineal societies because they're still, um, the structure is still patriarchal, but they are matrifocal. So there is the focus of the tribe is definitely, at least in some highlights, is focused on the girls and on the women, but I wouldn't say that this is 100% of the time. In ancient times, the cultures were both matrifocal and matrilineal 100% of the time, but I don't think that there was ever an instance of time when they were matriarchal, where the hierarchy was such that the women abused the power against the men. Mm -hmm. So this was not, this is very important to know. And now we have like, what, how, how long can you say we have this shift from matria, matrilinear and matrifocal times, like 30,000 years of knowledge of human beings? At least, if to, not more. At least to 3,000 years of patriarchal system. Yes. The results yes. we see now about property and abusing Mother Earth, if we say yes. so. Our yeah. mothers, so motherhood yes. is not valued, yes. not even the motherhood of our earth. So if we go back to these societies like who were much elder, longer, yes. what was the difference in these societies who were matrifocal or matrilinear? Could you explain, give us an example? I think the main difference is that there, it was not a warring society. There was no war, there was no need to fight. So the, it was a nourishing society where the focus was on the mothers and the children. The mothers were the focus of the tribe. The people were hunting and gathering and, and gathering food and could stay in such a mode of, of being for thousands of years, there was no need to defend themselves. There was no one invading. So it was a peaceful society. It was a peaceful society where everyone had their place. And so the, the huge difference is that there was no need to defend mm -hmm. against anything, mm -hmm. um, which it's, it's a huge difference, you know, if we're looking at how many wars there are at every given moment on this mm -hmm. planet, you know, 20 something at least right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, so these times, if I understand you well, in matrilinear or matrifocal societies, if there were no wars, there were women giving birth to, to men. Yes. You know, to, humans which were man so what how did the man then be in what status or why in these societies they they had what what consciousness did they have of of being man we don't know for sure um i think one of the the main uh, inspirations is ryan eisler she wrote the chalice and the blade about those peaceful societies um, the understanding is of the men as that their role was of providing. Mm -hmm. So that they did a lot of the gathering, definitely the hunting, 
and their consciousness as well as the women's consciousness was that the the thing that's most precious and needs to be protect well there wasn't anything to protect against here the language is the, the language we're so much used to living in a society where we need to protect all the time so because <laughs> we're under attack yeah, all the time they didn't have that so what what the understanding was that what is the the center the most revered and honored and sacred was the mother and the, the child, you know, the, the birthing mothers. So their role was to provide for them. So it was a role of provider, not so much protector because there wasn't anything to protect from, but provider. And there was, everyone knew their place in the same way that men didn't think that they could give birth. They didn't think of taking anything over. It wasn't conceived, you know. It was their role in the scheme of life. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we know about that, which I think exists still to a large extent in indigenous cultures in Native American and um, in India to a large extent, in Africa to a large extent, is that all the women of the tribe took care of all the children. There wasn't this nuclear mm -hmm. family and separation and this is my child and that one is not, but that all the children looked up to all the mothers, all the women of the tribe, and all the women saw all of the children as their own. And in that respect, the fathers did not have ownership. So that's where the line was from the mothers to the children, and the fathers had no ownership of the children. And there wasn't any, again, separation that, that we have now, which puts us in, in isolation. Mm -hmm. so, so life was much more communal mm -hmm. and therefore peaceful because the, the whole tribe was a unit. It wasn't just one family, but the tribe was a unit. If we, if we look at these ancient cultures nowadays and, and um, shift now in this society where, I mean, everything looks like to be changed and yes. needs a change, a big yes. change towards life, yeah. And honoring life. How? Uh, what? What can we? Can we learn something out of that now? And how can we? Would you suggest that we could try something new? What thing that the women gravitating towards one another in any and all situation when they bleed that they come together when they have babies that they start coming together. Uh, when they have childcare needs that, you know, they take turns collectively taking care of the children, that by us as women starting to join forces is the only way where we can start shifting because we can't wait for mm. this patriarchal society to shift because there is no, um, there is no impetus, there is no need for them to, to shift even though, of course, men are paying the price as well, but there isn't a sense of the dire need to change mm -hmm. like women have, mm -hmm. which things are, are you know, coming to a head and they have to shift. So, so my recommendation, it, it's a long way, it's a, it's a long road, but my recommendation is for us to start joining forces together. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is the calendar of the 13 times that a woman bleeds during a, a year, a solar year. We, the 12 months of the, mm -hmm. of the Gregorian calendar are very artificial. Mm -hmm. 28 days, 29, 30, 31. There is no cycle of nature that mm -hmm. matches those 12 mm -hmm. months. But in the 365 days that the Earth goes around the Sun, there are exactly 13 lunar cycles, mm -hmm. 13 moon cycle, mm -hmm. and women cycle with the moon. Mm -hmm. So this is really um, is an example of the very first calendar of humankind mm -hmm. because the understanding is that they marked every menstrual cycle that they had mm -hmm. and after 13 it was a year that mm -hmm. passed mm -hmm. and that was the way of marking time so that really our menstrual blood, our cycle, was a way of keeping time. Mm -hmm. Interesting to think of our cycle as a way of marking time mm -hmm. because it is a, 
it's a, a rhythm that is in sync with the cosmos, you know, with the, with the mm -hmm. moon. Uh, and our body is in sync with the moon, whereas the, the Gregorian calendar puts us out of sync with mm -hmm. every natural cycle mm -hmm. that there is. So it's another yeah. way of divorcing us and alienating us from nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and, and this is in this book from Maria Gimbutas, Die Sprache der Göttin. And yeah, um, you said you know her assistant. Yeah, Joan Marler has been her assistant for many, many years, and since Maria Gimbutas died, she's the carrier of her work. She's continuing her work and uh, travels internationally and teaches and continues the consciousness and spreading of the consciousness and the research. And she happens to live in the same town in California that I do, mm -hmm. and uh, she's a wonderful woman. Mm -hmm. And you can also go on her website? Yes, Archaeomythology. Dot org, I believe, mm -hmm. archaeomythology, and that is the archaeomythology is a concept that was created by Maria Gimbutas, where she didn't only discover ar she was an archaeologist, but rather than only discovering the artifacts and saying you know a figure of a woman this year a figure of a you know a ball that date, she really tried to imagine the mythology of the life of those peoples that she uh, excavated and found the, the remains of. So rather than just being scientific left brain, um, you know, masculine consciousness, she really tried to bring to life the, the living cultures of those times. Mm -hmm. Now we come back to, to your book, Becoming Peers, and you say it's mentoring girls into womanhood. Yes. And um, we would like to, to know some of, uh, you say it's a practical guide? So the first step, like I said before, the first step always is for the women, the mothers or the mentors, to start reconnecting with their own uh, menstrual cycle, shifting their consciousness, honoring themselves. That is always the first step. Mm -hmm. And then the next step, which... Um, I think is exciting for us as women to, to venture into and, and create is to start being actively involved in the lives of the girls as mothers as well as, as mentors. The, the time of adolescence is a time when girls and, and boys, but we're talking about girls now, really need to start separating from their mm -hmm. parents. Mm -hmm. There is too much focus of the, the nuclear family. So they're looking outside of their family and the girls are looking outside of their mother's influences. And this is where we as women in society have an exciting responsibility. So what I'm inviting women of all ages, mothers and non-mothers, to do is to start sitting together, even in social gatherings, in multi-age mm -hmm. multi groups of mm -hmm. women and girls that started menstruating, or women and girls in, in adolescence or in puberty. And to start, well, to move out of the chit-chat. You know, when we have social gatherings, when people come together, often we're just chatting about nothing. So realizing that as women, we have an opportunity here to shape the consciousness of the girls. We have been liberated in many ways in that we are looking very critically around us in the society to see how sexist the language might be, how sexist the advertising might be, how the messages that we are receiving are degrading women. Well, the girls, most of the women that are uh, coming to me are complaining how the girls are buying into the models and into the Twiggy model. Well, sit down and talk with them about how oppressive it was for you as a girl to receive these images. So let's sit down with them and start talking 
about what's real, about the generation of us and how women became bulimic and anorexic and what affects these um, images of womanhood and the, the sexualization of womanhood, the degradation of, of menstruation of women a, as a whole, what effect it had on us. So I'm, I'm inviting women in the book to start having a whole coming of age year journey with the girls in their lives. So that it's not only, and I want to touch about the, the celebration of the first menstruation, but it's not only the celebration of mm, here is a wow, highlight, yeah. the one moment, and then after that everything yeah. is the same, but to really take a year long journey with mentors that are various women that are involved in the girl's life and to start looking with them at the world around them in crit with critical eyes. So say one woman could be a mentor to the girl about all the messages she receives from the media. So for a month she can go out and start collecting all the advertisement that she hears on the radio, that she sees in the movies, that she sees in the magazines, just collecting it and then coming together with her mentor and starting to look at that and analyze what kind of messages is this giving me and are there any of these that I want to keep? Maybe nothing, maybe something. And to start realizing that we are bombarded with, with messages that are degrading us and the girls are not going to learn that unless we sit down and discuss this with them. So that's an, one, mm -hmm. one example of a task that one mentor can take. These are examples of, of tasks that the girls can do as a symbol of their transition from girlhood to womanhood. So there are some tasks there that are about um, saying goodbye to a childhood object. And so there are things that the girls are leaving behind when they start um, moving into adolescence. They're not yet adults, but they're no longer young girls. And then there are other tasks that are calling them to um, endurance, that are calling them to maturity, that are calling them to accountability, tasks that are involved with um, social responsibility, taking something um, um, of, of herself and gifting her, her society. So, so having a year long where the mother invites mentors to each of them accompany her girl in one aspect of life because we as mothers mm -hmm. cannot do it all. Mm -hmm. And the girl would start having meaningful relationships with other women in her life and if we don't provide that, the girls will look for other influences and it may be influences that we really don't want them to have and they're also open to all of the media influences which I wouldn't want my daughter to be exposed to. So, um, so really starting to create a community, a conscious community of women who are raising their own consciousness and are sharing authentically with the girls what that journey is and mentoring those girls into a conscious womanhood and modeling to the girls a conscious womanhood. And in the midst of all of that, really uh, trying to also specifically honor and celebrate and welcome the girls when each of them comes to her first blood, which in indigenous cultures has been done. So there are also very practical um, suggestions in the book uh, from very uh, modest ceremonies to very elaborate ceremonies. Um, there is a woman friend of mine whose daughter, uh, since she was seven or eight, was asking to have her ears pierced. And her mother said, when you get your first blood, we will pierce your ears. So she saved this something which is, um, it's, it's not trivial, I mean, it is a little painful. It is, a, a, in a way, a shift in your physical body. And she wanted her to wait. Mm -hmm. So now the girl is no, knows mm -hmm. that something that she is really wanting, that she is looking forward to her first mm -hmm. blood, which is when her ears would get pierced. Um, some families that I know, that I worked with, just go and have a wonderful meal. Some families have um, ceremonies where they invite all the women that are involved in the girl's life 
the grandmothers, the aunts, the friends, uh, maybe her girlfriend's mothers. Um, often each woman would bring a gift for the girl and often the gifts would be red. It might be a red scarf or a piece of jewelry that has red in it or a piece of clothing with red in it, a journal. Um, a lot of women would bring gifts that are geared to um, teach the girl to really um, nourish herself during her blood. So, you know, bath salts mm -hmm. and candles and, and um, lotions so that she is invited to really pamper her physical body mm -hmm. while she's cycling. The idea is of making a rite mm -hmm. of passage, mm -hmm. a marking mm -hmm. from girlhood to womanhood and a celebration and a welcoming. You are now one of us. You are now a woman. You might be very young. There may be things that you're not able yet to do, but in some way you cross the, the line and you are one of us. You're welcomed into the family of women. Mm -hmm. And it's um, when the girls are celebrated in that way, they are the girls that I have seen that were celebrated, they say that they will remember that day for the rest mm -hmm. of their lives, you know, that this is something that is more than any birthday that they had, that this is really something mm -hmm. that is feeding their heart and, and their soul. Mm. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you very much for the interview that you came here to Vienna. We have a nice evening, yes. and the moon is still going to be full, like tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Yes. So another cycle ended. Yeah. And, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me, and it was a pleasure to have a dialogue with you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.